Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And on today's Roundtable podcast, it's a super small, intimate group. Um, we've got Tate, the big Papa Litchfield. Tate, how are you? Uh, loving life. Just enjoying this good Vegas weather this time of year. Nice. Nice. How's that baby treating you? She's good. I think she's uh, starting teething, so we've been up uh, a little bit more than normal. But uh, from what I understand, I asked uh, Alexa this morning, I said, Alexa, how long do babies teeth? And she said, several years, which uh, kind of crushed me a little bit. So uh, let's hope that it's not several years. <laughs> I, I don't remember my babies teething for several years. Eric? Yeah, well, no, that's from Landopia.com. Eric Peterson, how are you, Eric? I'm good. I was just going to say, I don't think uh, my kids teethed for that long. I think, you know, maybe on and off, you know, it goes through some, some bad phases and what have you, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, when, when she said, babies can teeth for several years, I was like, oh, this, <laughs> that can't be right. Yeah. That can't be right. But then again, she would never lie to me. Alexa's like, one of my best friends. So why would she lie to me? Just didn't make yeah, it. I'll, I'll tell you what, what, what is a lot of fun is having a 12 year old daughter going on 22. Like mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you how many eye rolls I'm getting now. Like what just, what happened? Where did that sweet girl go? You need to do a tally. Like you need to just start logging them every day. The eye roll. Yeah. And see, see what your high score is at the end of the week. <laughs> you, you get the most. Yeah. It's not bad. Um, so you got, look, you, got, you got that to look forward to, Tate. Fantastic. This parenting thing just keeps getting better. Yeah. No, it's, you know, every phase is fun though. Right, Eric? Yeah, they're all different, but uh, each one is a new challenge. It's a lot of fun though. Yeah. As, as Grant Cardone would say, new problems. Right. Hey. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. It honestly is a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. So we had a... Uh, a very busy week with Black Friday, Cyber Monday. But before we talk about that, um, let's kind of get into the, the weeds a little bit about deeds of trust. What is a deed of trust? Um, when do you use a deed of trust? And ultimately, why we don't use deeds of trust. So Eric Peterson, what, was, what were some of the questions uh, you were getting? Uh, I've actually had a question about a deed of trust on... Uh, two separate occasions in the, in the past couple of weeks. One was from a seller inquiring about a deed of trust and, or, or I'm sorry, a buyer inquiring about a deed of trust. And uh, because basically they wanted the deed up front. Um, and another one was a, a fellow land geek person just asking about uh, selling on a deed of trust. If uh, you know, their buyer had requested it and wanted to know if that was a good idea and how to go about it. Right, right. Uh, Tate, do you know what a deed of trust is? Yeah, but I honestly don't have a ton of experience with them. Um, you know, I'm probably going to learn on this one just because when I see them, I know they're complicated. And I, whenever I've come across them, I've never had anyone ask me to deed them a property via a deed of trust or anything like that. So if I see them, I tend to walk the other way because it's more of a complicated issue than I want to deal with. And I'm after the low hanging fruit. So deeds right. of trust, trust are not what I consider low hanging fruit. Yeah. What's interesting though, is you actually signed a deed of trust and you probably didn't realize it when you bought your home. And what it was, was the bank saying, Hey, as long as you make your mortgage payments every month, we are not going to foreclose on this property. And a deed of trust is the bank's way or the, uh, Lender, the yep. lender's way of securing that property so that they can actually deed the property to you and then go through the foreclosure process if you don't make your payments to the lender. So you get the deed in your name, but if you stop making payments, the lender has to go through the foreclosure process essentially. And that's what the deed of trust spells out in detail is how that will be affected, what your rights are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's not that long a document, maybe two pages. And it's pretty basic, right? Uh, when I first started in land, I hired a very expensive attorney 
in a firm in Nevada. And this is when I started doing uh, owner financing for the first time. And they said, oh, no, 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 you can't use land contract. You got to use a deed of trust. And they gave me all these good reasons why. Um, well, it turns out the best reason to do a deed of trust was that they would get fees for going through the foreclosure process, which at the time was about three to $5,000 per property. Now, remember, we're not doing credit checks here. These are low, you know, inexpensive properties. And I found out very quickly that a few uh, foreclosures could wipe out all my profits, right? Very, very quickly. So that's why we started going to the land contract. A land contract essentially is the lender's way of, of protecting themselves in case of foreclosure. There's no cost of foreclosure. They own the property until the buyer or the borrower pays off their note. Now, the reason that attorneys don't like this is that if you have an unscrupulous seller, they can double, triple, quadruple sell the same property and nobody would know, right? So, makes sense. But in our situation, we are not unscrupulous. We actually have the land contract, the purchase sale agreement, and the promissory note, and we guarantee free and clear title by the time that they actually uh, pay off their note. So there's the buyer is protected, but we're also protected on the downside, no costs or of foreclosure. So I, I was talking a lot there. Eric Peterson, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, I think those are all valid points you make. I think that um, the, the objection that we as sellers might often run into, or I, I guess I wouldn't say often, but on occasion run into is is the buyer that says, you know, well, I'm buying this land. I want to do what I, whatever I want with it. I want to, you know, start building my house. I want to, you know, pull a permit and put in septic or, or whatever it is. And, um, you know, they become concerned that they're not going to be able to do that without their deed in hand, um, which is, which is probably true from what I understand. Um, but, once again, we, we have a, an opportunity to, to solve that problem for them as well, if we so choose. Um, you know, for me, I kind of have some, some qualifiers around that in that I want a buyer to have a decent amount of principal paid on the property before I'm willing to explore giving them a deed. But, but essentially, and I know, Mark, you've talked about this, but I'll just kind of recap it. What we can do is deed the property to them have them sign a, a deed back to us. A that deed we in lieu of foreclosure deed, signed and notarized, yeah. Yeah, and then we just hold that. And, you know, as long as they continue to make their payments, we don't do anything with it. Once they're paid in full, we can shred it. But in the meantime, that's our protection to, to go ahead and file that if, if uh, that buyer stops making payments. Yeah, and it's a pretty rare event where I actually have a buyer that wants to make improvements right away. Actually, I mean, Tate, when's the last time somebody contacted you and said, Hey, I've got to own the property. We're going to start building right away. We need permits. I mean, I think I've had it happen once maybe. And then when I told them, yeah, no problem. Um, let's go ahead and get the process started. Uh, I explained how everything was going to work and that, uh, you know, they would need to call the county and figure out what they were going to have to do in order to get those permits. Uh, they ended up not pursuing it any further. And they told me they were just going to wait until they owned the land uh, officially. So I honestly can say I've never had somebody try to even build on our properties legally, right? Legally. Right. <laughs> right. I think what happens too is a lot of buyers, they, they have big plans, right? They're excited about buying the property and, you know, they have all these, these thoughts and dreams of what they're going to do with it. And then, you know, they, they start to, you know, think about that. But the reality is once they start paying for the land, I think it's often becomes less of a priority for them to start, you know, making those improvements, whether it's, they don't have the money or things change for them or whatever it is. But um, I've had a number of people talk about it, but then no one ever comes back and says, okay, you know, I really need to do this now. So. Right. Right. Um, Amazing. Amazing. Um, in, in the sense that like anybody would want to even do a deed of trust, really. Yeah. There's no, think about it. There's no reason why you would, honestly. 
Yeah. Now, if we want to get into the weeds on this, there are a few states that require deeds of trust in a way, right? Now, in the Investor's Toolkit, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but we actually have a, a program that talks about how you can actually do land contracts in the state of Texas, which does not allow land contracts, but I don't want to get too far into the weeds. So there are states that uh, I think Florida is another state that also frowns on land contracts, but there is a way and there is a legal workaround so that you are still protected and get the benefits of a land contract without actually violating state law by doing a land contract, if that makes sense. Um, so hopefully that's pretty clear. Is that pretty, do we think we, we went over deeds of trust enough? I think so. Yep. All right. All right, just another reminder that today's podcast is sponsored by GeekPay.io, the only set it and forget it way of getting paid on an automated basis, automated notifications, ACH, credit cards as a backup. You can take down payments. And oh, by the way, go ahead, Tate. I was just going to say, I don't think we stress how awesome the down payment feature is on GeekPay enough. I mean, Mark, explain it to people how they can use it. Because, you know, just saying, oh, you can make a down payment here. It's much more than that. It's, it's such a cool feature. And I use it every single day. Yeah. I mean, essentially, it, you create a link and you can embed that link on your website. You can put it into social media. You can email them the link. I mean, and it takes about You can about use it two in your three, Black yeah. Friday deals. On your Black Friday deals. I mean, it, it takes two, three mm -hmm. seconds to create. And it works beautifully. You can set it up with Stripe um, or authorized.net. We recommend Stripe. And it just integrates beautifully. It's, it's so simple to do. And if you go to the landgeek.com forward slash geek pay, you can get your first note set up for free and start using it on a trial basis. So it's, it's really phenomenal. I mean, I, I sent it out. Uh, I created a down payment link today and, and sent it to the guy. And I love it because I can say, oh, yeah, I'm going to make a, a custom one-time use down payment link it's secure you know and you can go in there and you can make that link say whatever you want so i could have it say mark podolsky down mark podolsky down payment for x property five acres right and send it right. via email to that individual they click on it it got their name in it there's a sense of security with that they make their payment boom make it as easy as possible for people to pay me so i love it it's like i mean geek pay is amazing but that feature is one of the most, uh, it doesn't get enough love. It really does. I'm not sure why we're not blowing up with GeekPay, but I, I have a sense that it's just not, I'm not educating the market well enough on how inexpensive it is. So it's, you're saving money and you're saving time. And if you're doing it the way that we do it with a note setup fee, after one note, it actually doesn't cost, like your second note, it actually makes you money. It's actually a profit center for you. So check out, learn more, get a demo. Go to get a demo at geekpay.io um, or just sign up, thelandgeek.com forward slash geekpay. So let's move on to our second topic, the marketing. The marketing of Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Uh, Tate, what was your strategy going into these big shopping days? Make it irresistible. Um, I went into it knowing that our customers during this time of the year, everybody is, you know, used to spending money. They're motivated to spend money. They're looking for a good deal, but most importantly, they want to feel like they're winning. If I look at everything I purchased over the last weekend, I didn't purchase it because I needed it. I purchased it because I felt like I was, I was winning. I was beating the store by buying. So, and so that's the approach we did. And, uh, you know, we had a great, uh, four or five days there. I think we sold five properties, um, two for cash, three on terms. I mean, it was, it was a crazy weekend for us. It was, it was fantastic. So, and I don't think it stopped. I'm still getting emails from the Black Friday deals that we ran and from some of our other uh, promos that we ran. People saying, hey, is this good? Could I extend it? How, when's the deadline? And, you know, obviously we're pretty flexible here and if they're real, really willing to buy, then uh, that's when those key pay links come into, come into play. I love it. I love it. What was the total enterprise value on the sales? Uh, 
Let me check. While he's checking, Eric Peterson, what was your strategy for Black Friday and Cyber Monday? And did you email or how, how was, what was your marketing? Yeah, so my marketing around Black Friday, Cyber Monday was, was strictly uh, just my buyer's list. Um, nothing outside of that. Um, well, actually, I take that back. There were some personal emails I sent out as well. Um, but uh, my strategy was to limit it um, to a short amount of time. There was, there was a sale that ran on Black Friday, and there was one that ran on Cyber Monday. Um, I previewed that sale uh, earlier in the week and kind of made people aware it was coming and, um, you know, then launched it as promised and uh, it was pretty successful for me as well. How many, so, how many sales? Well, um, so one was directly uh, in response to one of my Cyber Monday deals where um, the customer used that down payment link that was in the email and, and paid to, to put the, uh, the down payment and doc fee on that property. The other three um, either came from the preview of the sale or just um, kind of, there was a, another one that was, it was basically a specialized deal based on, you know, the time of the year it was um, to a particular buyer that was interested in a couple properties. So um, all in all, I sold uh, four properties essentially over the weekend and um, it was probably um, about somewhere around 30 some 32,000 or so in enterprise value. See, that would make Mrs. Peterson happy <laughs> because you're not doing bad. this on the side. Yeah, not it's bad. Not, it's not bad. How about you, Tate? It was 44.5 for yeah. enterprise value. I mean, it was a pretty, pretty awesome week. Um, passive income alone on that one went up uh, $720 a month. Yeah, I mean that that really does move the needle, and, and I think the the bottom line or the the takeaway from this for people listening to the roundtable is that sales don't slow during the holidays, right? You can create the demand, take advantage of the Black Friday promo, take advantage of the Cyber Monday promo, and then as we're going towards the season, and people are taking time off, keep making it irresistible for them. We are busy throughout December. Go ahead, Tate. Well, I was just going to say, and keep pounding that buyer's list. You know, this is stuff that we talk about in, you know, coaching. We talk about it at boot camp. the power behind a buyer's list. And if you're not showing up every week, Eric and I will, right? We're going to show up every week. And that's how we convert our buyer's list into active buyers. I mean, our, our Black Friday sale sold within four minutes. Yeah, four I mean, minutes. That's crazy. We had, we had two other people try to buy it and emailed us afterwards and said, Hey, uh, it's not accepting my payment anymore. What's going on? And, and I was deep frying a turkey. I had no idea or eating deep fried <laughs> turkey. I don't even know what I was doing. And I got an email and it was like, what's going on here? Why is everybody freaking out? You know? And it was, it's awesome. So you just gotta be super proactive. We hit the phone so hard this last weekend during black Friday every lead that had ever contacted us in regards to the properties we were selling, we were on the phone with them. We sent them personalized emails. There's so much more that goes into it. Um, and we were active, we were super aggressive. And as a result, I think we had a pretty successful weekend. Yeah. I mean, Eric, how, how often do you, do you get the fear that, Hey, if I email too much, they're going to unsubscribe, they're going to get mad. I'm going to burn my list. Is that a, is that a real legitimate fear that you have? It's, it's not a fear I have. Um, on occasion, I will get an email from a, you know, someone on the list asking to be unsubscribed or telling me I email too much or, or different things like that. But, um, you know, I kind of just look at that as, uh, I don't, I don't, it doesn't bother me, I guess, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, nobody else is complaining. I mean, if, if five people complain and everybody else is fine, um, I'm doing okay. So, 
Yeah, I mean, I actually think of it as a gauge or sort of a badge of honor. Two things I really love to get on a weekly basis. The first thing I love to get is a a really rude response to an offer, right? I know we're showing up and I know we're sending out the offers at a low enough price that it's even getting this emotional, visceral response that someone would even take the time to respond and try to ruin my day. That is amazing to me. The second one is too many emails, right? That means we're showing up and we're showing up and we're top of mind awareness. And just like Coca-Cola, I mean, I can't email Coke or Apple or any of these, you know, huge companies with these billion dollar marketing budgets when I'm watching TV and email them too many commercials, right? But the fact that they're emailing us and saying, hey, too many emails, I think that's, that's a really good gauge that we're doing something right, right? Um, and I, I think it's, it's, you want to be getting those emails. You want to be showing up so much that there's a response to it. Otherwise, you're probably not showing up enough. It's, I know it's counterintuitive, but you know, as long as your lead gen is big enough you, and you're putting out your ads on Craigslist, you're building your list every day, it's, it's inevitable that people are going to unsubscribe. So your job is not to you know, try to please everyone in the market. Your job is to please the people that are interested in actually investing in your raw land. And one thing that's kind of interesting about that, I get people ask me all the time, how big is your buyer's list? How big of a buyer's list do I need? And the answer is, uh, you need how many emails, how many properties are you going to sell to your buyer's list a year? Is it 10? Is it 20? Well, if it's 20, then you need 20 active buyers on your buyer's list, right? I don't care if people unsubscribe because I'd rather not send them an email. If they're not interested in what I'm selling, then, then you know, be gone. Good riddance. So it's better to have a smaller group of active buyers than it is having a list or a buyer's list of a hundred thousand people, you know? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Doesn't totally agree. Mean- I remember Larry Overstreet sold property to a list of one. Yeah. I, on his I remember list. that. That was so awesome. He didn't want to send it. Remember? He was like, ah, oh, yeah. guys already one person the on property. And right. he sent it out. And sure enough, the guy was like, yeah, okay, fine. I don't want to miss out on it. I'll take it. Sold it. Yeah. Awesome. I remember when Jeff Axton sold property like seven minutes the first time emailing to his buyers list. And he had like, you know, less than like 20 people on there. He's like, mock, it really walks. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Keep doing it. Don't stop. So, don't stop. So I apologize for everybody in the Boston area for that accent. I miss, I miss Mike Zeno. I know. All right. Tips of the week. Are we ready? Oh yeah. Yeah. All right, Eric, you, you going to start? Sure. I'll start. So um, it's come up recently a, a couple of different times with, with different um, land geek members. So I thought it was worth bringing up as a tip of the week. Um, I use a company called Cap Forge uh, for my bookkeeping. Um, a lot of people don't enjoy doing bookkeeping, um, but Cap Forge basically does it all for you. Um, you've actually had him on the podcast, Matt. Um, I forget his last name. It starts with an R. Um, yeah, yeah, he was great. But uh, so I really like their service. It's it's priced. Matt, Matt Ramuzzi. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So it's priced pretty reasonably. Um, you can reach out to him for, through his website and uh, let him know that uh, you're doing land and, and they know how to, how to account for it and everything else. So I really like it. I think it, it makes my life easier. So. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. You know what I've been using is the app hurdler and I go in every day and I just, you know, and I've got so many companies I can separate it by company. So which expenses for which company and which, um, you know, uh, revenues for which company as well. And then what's kind of cool about it is um, you can pick where you want to integrate from. So, you know, the accounts for my bank will just integrate also from, uh, well, actually that's the way, that's the way to really the best way to do it. Because if you have like Stripe and PayPal, you have double things from the bank. So it just integrates right. with your bank and, um, it's really cool. But Capforge is, is an awesome, awesome tip. And I hate when Eric Peterson gives, gives awesome tips, but that is 
a really great tip because look, does anybody really want to spend their time doing bookkeeping? You make no money doing bookkeeping, number one. Um, and number two, you make no money doing bookkeeping. It's just not a good use of time. <laughs> and it's uh, not fun. At all. And it's not fun at all. Even if it were fun, it's still not a good use of time. Tate, what about you? What's your yeah. tip of the week? All righty. So my tip of the week kind of stems from a situation. I had a property that was sitting for a long, long time and didn't, didn't matter what I did to it. I could adjust the pricing, come up with new copy, and I couldn't get this thing to move. And it was a great property. It should have sold a lot sooner. And so I was uh, looking at its file one day and trying to figure out why it was kind of just stagnant. And I looked over the images and I realized that our images were just terrible. But being the cheap guy that I am, I still didn't want to go out and spend a ton of money to pay somebody to go take professional grade photos. So I was searching the, the old interweb and I uh, was looking for a website and I, I literally typed in make my screenshot better. Um, because I got my photos off Google Earth or Google Maps, right? And they were just screenshots. And it was really overcast that day. And so the pictures just aren't very appealing. And I came across a website called BeFunky.com. I'm going to drop it in the chat for you guys. And BeFunky.com. And it's a really cool service because you can, it's a free service. You can upload an image and basically edit it however you'd like. And they've got a feature on there that does kind of like the magic one click done for you edit where it'll saturate the colors, make things a lot more appealing. And the thing that I found interesting about it was I changed it. I changed some of our photos on Craigslist and on Landmoto and uh, it actually sold. Same images as before, just a whole lot better looking. And I actually got this tip, uh, this idea kind of from, from Eric. Believe it or not, Mark, at uh, the oh last. Oh my gosh! Yeah, the last boot camp. Eric was showing me how he uh, kind of doctors up his photos and how he has great success doing it. Well, I'm not uh, a Photoshop wizard, so I had to find something a little bit easier and simpler to use. So, BeFunky.com um, was the answer to it. And so, I've is had this better than Canva? Can I've this replace Canva? Canva? I've never used it. Um, Eric. I haven't used this tool. Um, I pretty much live in Photoshop and Lightroom and some of those pretty advanced tools. So okay. I don't have any reasonable feedback for you. I mean, All right. Photoshop and Lightroom, there, there's a fee associated with those that yeah. you probably, I mean, it's a big fee where indeed Canva, I don't know. Is there a fee associated with it, Mark? Um, I, I think Canva is free. Unless no, you, 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 you buy, like, you can pay like a dollar for like an image here or image there if you want to get like something else. But there's like, their standard images are kind of free. It's, it's, a, it's a freemium model, basically. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I use this, this service today and uh, the last few days, and I've had pretty good success with it. So if you're looking to, uh, you know, make your images a little bit more appealing, check out uh, Be Funky or Canva, see which one works best for you. All right, cool, very cool. Um, all right, you said you had the tip to end all tips. Let's hear I, it. I have a, a really, a really geeky, geeky tip. I'm gonna send it in the chat. You guys check this out. And what this does is basically uses, it's like inexpensive, machine learning, right? Um, you know, we all know machine learning is what big companies are using right now. Well, here's machine learning for the rest of us. And you can turn emails, tweets, surveys, or any text into actionable data. You can automate business workflows and save hours of manual data processing. It integrates with my favorite uh, program, Zapier. I mean, you can automate workflows. You can analyze text data. Um, it's really, really cool what you can do. It, it's got an API um, as well. And you can save hours of manual data processing. But, you know, one of the use cases for this might be, let's say uh, you want to do some machine learning on, uh, let's say, uh, 
you know, your emails, right? So if somebody emails you about one of your promos. Well, you could automate it so that it would respond basically on the keyword text, right? So how nice would that be where you would have keywords and it would just, you know, the machine learning would kind of respond to it. You can do stuff with social media. Eric Peterson, I can see his, his, his mind is racing right now. This is like one of those things like at, at first you're like, what? And then it's like, it's, it's almost in the, in, the, in the realm of like an air table. Um, you got to play with it. There's lots you can do with it. Um, it's, it's really, really cool, but it is the future. So check it out. Monkeylearn.com. And the pricing is crazy low. Uh, a thousand queries a month is free. A thousand queries a month is free. And you get one custom module. Um, a custom module, up to 3,000 training samples per module. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. So are you using it for anything at this point? Um, I am actually exploring using it for a variety of different use cases uh, with marketing. So this okay. would be a marketing uh, response for me. Hmm. Yeah. I like it. Seems yeah. cool. I need to play with it. Exactly. Yeah, you, yeah, you got to play with it. You got you to mess with it. The but pricing it's cool. Though. The pricing is pretty good. Even if It does jump up it. a bit. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, even if you pay for it, if it's still, if it's producing solid data that turns into sales, then $300 a month, I mean, that's just one or two sales, right? And doc fees. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go to resources, um, you know, they got their blog and they kind of talk about some use cases and how to use it. So, you know, one of the popular posts is, um, you know, keep tabs on competitors with a customized product hunt notifications bot, right? Um, I mean, it's just kind of cool. What, you know, building a personalized notification system for help a reporter out. So you could just automate outreach to a PR firm or a reporter based on the keywords because they need information. So it's, you can get deep into the woods with this for sure. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's cool. It's cool. It's really geeky. Okay. But there's a lot you can do. I mean, m machine learning is the future for sure. Like All right, it. guys. Are, are we good? Yeah. Is any, anything else we should discuss? Uh, I do want to remind everybody, like, boot camp is filling up super fast. So go to landgeek.com forward slash boot camp. Um, and if you got the toolkit or flight school, utilize your, your two free tickets. Um, I know that the room block is full. I'm not sure if the hotel is full yet. Is the hotel full, Eric? I don't think so. Um, myself, I, I booked a room outside of the room block, so I didn't have any issue doing that. Okay. Hopefully you got a good rate, but it's It's an amazing, it's an amazing hotel. Uh, San Antonio, go to the, the landgeek.com forward slash bootcamp, learn more. Um, but I know there's only a few spots left, so do not dawdle. Do not dawdle. Hey, Mark. Um, yeah. How come people haven't been sending us in their tip of the weeks? Right? Remember, you we know, were you, talking about it. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, I have gotten a few tips of the week. Oh, you're um, holding but them off. Is it's that not that I'm holding them off. Are? It's that a lot of them are we've already discussed. Ah. So I, we haven't got anything that, that is real publishable yet. But keep, keep sending us your, your tips of the week, everybody. So they realize how hard it really is then to find a tip of the week. It is hard to find a tip of the week, especially with our geeky group. I mean, it's tough. So, um, but yeah, keep doing that for sure. And, um, you know, give us feedback on anything. It doesn't have to be the tip of the week. If you guys want to hear, hear a topic or um, want us to be nicer to Eric, let us know. Just email us. But you until they email. Ask. Until they yeah, ask, so we're not doing it, right? We're not going to do it, no. <laughs> you know, support at thelandgeek.com. And hopefully everybody had a great Thanksgiving and, um, you know, surrounded by f friends and family and family and friends. And it's great. I, lo I love Thanksgiving. It's, it's def definitely the best holiday uh, for me. Just It's all about the food and company, right? Now I'm stressed out. I got to go shopping. You know, I got to start looking for deals. My wife's like, I saved so much money. 
You know, I'm like, oh, gosh, do they really need that? And then I look like, you know, the Grinch and the Scrooge. And then, you know, we start fighting. I'm like, okay, fine. Let them have, you know, whatever they want. It's not worth the, the, the argument, you know. I, the, the question is, like, when are the kids spoiled or not? I don't know. <laughs> it's a tough one. I mean, you know, you you got a few years of this, uh, Tate. Eric, what about you? Do you ever have any issues with, with spoiling the kids? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's hard not to. Um, yeah, it's hard, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think what we're, you know, what we do is um, we actually buy gifts for a lot of underprivileged families. Um, and so we actually have the kids shop for them. And that way we, they kind of get a sense of perspective. And it's like, you know, you look at their list and it's like, they want socks, they want a shirt. Um, they want, you know, like, very, very basic things. Yeah. And, you know, my kids are like the iPad pro. I'm like, okay. (laughs) It's all all good. (laughs) But try to give them perspective. All right. Uh, Well, I want to thank all the listeners and also remind you guys, please subscribe, please rate, please review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at the link.com. We'll give you for free the $97 passive income launch kit all right guys you ready one two three let Let freedom freedom ring ring. oh no (laughs) uh you know that was a solid like b minus it's not bad we do our best yeah we do we really do all right tate you going for lunch now i think so i gotta go uh talk with allison but i'm not sure where we're going Oh, nice. Yeah. Yesterday was Monday. I took the whole day off and, you know, my wife and I, you know, we, we, the beauty, it was like beautiful. And we went to start, we walked to Starbucks and we had Starbucks together. Then we went to uh, the Scottsdale quarter. We sat outside and we had Kona grill together. And then she went to pick up the kids and I got some work done and hung out with the kids. It was, it was such a great day. I'm like, well, this is a really good terminal day. If I die today, pretty good. Pretty good day. That's how I how I rate it. I don't know. I know it's kind of morbid. Eric's like, Mark, you're a weird dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You can say it. All right. All right, guys. Talk to you. Talk to you later. Bye.